Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video deals with the synthesis of tert butyl chloride by an SN1 reaction mechanism. This is part one, the pre-lab lecture. In this experiment, you'll read the procedure in the lab manual, you'll view this narrated PowerPoint presentation, watch the videos on parts two and three for the experiment that actually show it being done, then complete the associated notebook and post lab template file on Google Docs and then submit it to Canvas. Complete the lab homework on saplinglearning.com and finally take the quiz for this experiment on saplinglearning.com. The mechanism for this experiment is shown on this slide. Here's the starting material, tert butyl alcohol. Tert butyl alcohol has an OH group and OH groups are poor leaving groups because OH leaves as OH minus, which is a very strong base and a poor leaving group. So tert butyl alcohol in itself will not undergo a substitution reaction. However, when it's put in with a strong acid like hydrochloric acid, the OH group is going to get protonated and protonation of that hydroxyl group will make it into a good leaving group. The alcohol pulls a proton off of the hydrochloric acid to generate a protonated tert butyl alcohol. The protonated alcohol here is a good leaving group because it will leave as water and water is a weak base. That allows the leaving group to leave, which generates a tertiary carbocation, which is a good carbocation. And then, in a second step, the chloride can react as a nucleophile, attacking the carbocation carbon to produce a substitution product, tert butyl chloride, which is the goal of this experiment. Water is also produced as a coproduct when it leaves in the formation of the carbocation. These are the SN1 substitution products. The thing is, there's another pathway that competes. In addition to the carbocation reacting with a nucleophile, the carbocation can also react with a weak base. And in this case, water is the best weak base in the system. It can deprotonate the carbocation at the spot next to the carbocation carbon, which gives an alkene. Carbocation carbon here ends up being that carbon in the product. And the position beta to it there ends up being there. So we have a new carbon-carbon double bond. This is an E1 elimination reaction, and E1 reactions compete with SN1. That's one of the features of SN1 and E1 as they go together. The product here is 2-methylpropene, which is a gas at room temperature. It won't be difficult to get rid of this product. It'll just evaporate as it forms, so we won't be able to detect it in the product mixture. We'll just see that something happened in that the yield of tert butyl chloride is quite a bit lower than we would expect. Here's a summation of some reactions going on in this experiment. The balanced equation for the formation of tert butyl chloride from tert butyl alcohol is shown here. Use this equation for your yield calculations. One mole of tert butyl alcohol reacts with one mole of concentrated hydrochloric acid to give one mole of tert butyl chloride and two moles of water. One thing that's important to note is tert butyl alcohol is somewhat water soluble, so it dissolves pretty well in the aqueous HCl. The product, however, tert butyl chloride, is water insoluble and it will form a layer on top of water. That'll make it easy to separate from the reactants in the mixture. We'll just have to separate the top layer and the bottom layer. The reaction contains a quite a bit of strong acid that'll need to be neutralized. The neutralization of hydrochloric acid with sodium bicarbonate, a weak base, produces carbon dioxide, which is a gas. In the process, we're gonna to need to then vent our separatory funnel often, frequently, to avoid pressure buildup. Here's the equation that describes that reaction. One mole of sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda, by the way, reacts with one mole of hydrochloric acid to produce one mole of CO2, which is a gas, two moles of water, and one mole of sodium chloride. The key feature here is the formation of the gas, which generates pressure if the reaction is done in a separatory funnel and allowed to build up. So you want to avoid that to keep the cap from blowing off the separatory funnel. Here are some yield calculations. First, you'll want to calculate the moles of tert butyl alcohol that were used in the reaction, and you'll do that using the density of tert butyl alcohol, which you'll have to look up, and the molecular weight, which you can calculate. That'll allow you to convert volume of tert butyl alcohol into a mass of tert butyl alcohol, and then molecular weight will allow you to convert it to moles. To determine the moles of hydrochloric acid that we are using, H3O plus Cl minus, use the molarity of concentrated hydrochloric acid, which is 12 molar, or 12 moles per liter. Then compare the moles of the reagents that you're using. The balanced equation here is a one-to-one -one ratio. So in this case, determining limiting reagent is simple because whichever reagent is smaller in terms of moles will be the limiting reagent. There'll be less of it. It'll run out first. Calculate the theoretical yield of the reaction using an equation with the following three terms. We're gonna suppose that the limiting reagent was found to be 0.354 moles of tert butyl alcohol. 
This is the equation that'll get set up, and if you use these numbers in your calculator, you'll get 32.8 grams of tert-butyl chloride as the theoretical yield. Here's how that setup works. First put down the limiting reagent. This would be the 0.354 moles of tert-butyl alcohol. And here it's shown as being over one, and that one is just a placeholder to keep the numerator and the denominator separate. The next thing you'll include is the mole ratio of the product, the limiting reagent in the balanced equation. So what this term is saying is that you get one mole of tert-butyl chloride per every one mole of tert-butyl alcohol starting material, and that's from the balanced equation. I know that tert-butyl chloride has to go on top and tert-butyl alcohol has to go on the bottom because I need these terms to cancel and to be left with tert-butyl chloride in the product. Then the next term is the molecular weight of the product, and this allows us to convert the moles of product into grams of product. 92.57 grams of tert-butyl chloride are present in one mole of tert-butyl chloride. This will allow moles of tert-butyl chloride to cancel, and the final product will come up in units of grams of tert-butyl chloride, which is what we want. In this experiment, we're gonna learn a new technique called simple distillation. This is used to separate liquid mixtures and purify them based on differences in boiling points. So a liquid mixture is heated to boil and the most volatile component is separated first. Ideally, this is what happens. In reality, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, but in a simple ideal case, this is how it's gonna work. The vapor rises through the apparatus and moves away from the liquid mixture that contains higher boiling materials. The vapor then contacts a cold condenser that causes it to condense back to a liquid, which then is collected. And then the heat is increased to boil the next most volatile compound, and the process is repeated. So sequentially collecting liquids of higher boiling points from a mixture of several liquids is how it's used. This slide shows the setup for a simple distillation apparatus. There's quite a few pieces here. We're going to look at them one at a time. First is the distillation flask on the left. This is where you put your material to be distilled. That distillation flask should be about one half full. If it's more full than that, there's a risk that the mixture could boil over, bumping, and that could cause liquid to be splashed over. Rather than evaporating and condensing, it might just bump over. If it's less than half full, you can lose a lot of material in a process called holdup. Holdup is the loss of material because some liquid needs to vaporize to fill the volume of the flask. If the flask is very large, a lot of material will be stuck in the flask as a vapor. There's a heating mantle on the left side which is connected to a variable transformer. You're going to want to insert a boiling chip into the apparatus to keep the boiling smooth. Clamp the apparatus in at least two locations. One is here at the flask and another one is somewhere along the condenser. This will just keep it from flopping over. Cooling water gets hooked up to the condenser. The condenser is here. You want to have a hose from the faucet coming in through the bottom and then water exiting the apparatus at the top and going to a sink. The idea with having the water enter through the bottom is that air bubbles have a chance to go up in the apparatus and escape out the top. If you have it connected backwards, you'll notice the condenser doesn't stay full of water very well. The joints on the apparatus should be secured with Keck clamps. These are the plastic clamps that are shown on these joints. Make sure that the thermometer bulb is in the correct spot. You'll want to take a careful look at this diagram and see that your thermometer bulb here is right there. It's below the elbow of the distillation head here and the idea is is that when vapor climbs up in the apparatus it hits the bulb just before it turns the corner and goes and condenses becomes a liquid and rolls down and gets collected into the flask here. If the thermometer is not set at the right spot, you won't measure a correct temperature for the boiling liquid vapor. Set the transformer here to about 50% power. Different distillations will require different settings depending on how high boiling the material is. But for tert-butyl chloride, it's fairly low boiling and one half power is more than enough power to boil the liquid and distill it. One of the things you'll notice is that the temperature of the thermometer is not gonna rise right away. This is a common question that students have is, uh, okay, I've turned my apparatus on, it's getting hot down here, Maybe you can even see some boiling here. How come the thermometer is still at room temperature? Well, you got to think about what happens with the vapor. First the liquid boils, then the vapor climbs up in the apparatus. It takes a while for the vapor to climb up the apparatus, heat up the apparatus, and actually reach the thermometer. You won't notice the temperature rise in the thermometer until the vapor touches the thermometer bulb. And at that point, it's pretty close to distilling, to turning the corner, coming over here, touching the cold condenser, and rolling down. So you just have to keep an eye on everything. Record the temperature range of the material you collected as viewed on the thermometer. So when the liquid is distilling over, take note of the temperature on the thermometer and as the distillation progresses, record that temperature as you collect liquid. 
Some safety items for today, we're going to be working with concentrated hydrochloric acid and that's extremely corrosive and it gives off very strong fumes. This is a powerful reagent and needs to be treated very carefully. You'll need to wear gloves when you're handling it and you'll also work with it in uh, a very well ventilated space. You'll want to pour hydrochloric acid in a fume hood. You'll want to not breathe the vapors and work in a well ventilated space. Terpbutyl alcohol is a flammable solvent. It's also an irritant. Wear gloves when you handle that material. The product, terpbutyl chloride, is a flammable volatile liquid. You'll want to work with that in adequate ventilation. After the reaction is done, we're going to wash the product with sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the HCl in the reaction. That process produces a lot of CO2 gas. The issue with that is that the separatory funnel can build up pressure if you're not careful. So you'll want to be particularly careful to vent the separatory funnel regularly to keep the pressure from building up. If you forget about this step, the top could blow off of the apparatus and liquid could splash out. Also, during the distillation, you don't want to distill it to dryness. Distilling to dryness would mean distilling past the point where there's liquid left in the distillation flask, the flask that's hot. You don't want to do that because the flask will get very, very hot at the end. You can get residues that build up that are difficult to clean, sometimes contain explosive peroxides even. So don't distill to dryness. During a distillation, you need to watch the level of the liquid in the distilling flask and stop the process before all the liquid completely disappears. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.